and um, I'm very happy to uh, be sharing my three-year-old work to everyone, um, especially the students of the Faculty of Arts and Letters, and to listen to the insights of my reactor, Dr. Jenny Osto Orto Orto was was there. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to uh, my colleagues in the Department of Philosophy. And I, I'm honored to present to you my paper or my uh, study on Simone de Beauvoir's existentialist feminism, a critical, a critical reading of the Philippine Magna Carta of women. So let me give a short background on the inspiration of this study. Um, it, it's it's a study inspired uh, by my academic background being political science and my attempt or the, uh, my challenge to myself to connect it with uh, a later um, field of specialization or study which is philosophy and a fur uh, I tried to further challenge myself to connect the two and resulted to uh, studying about feminism. This is also something that I would like to contribute to uh, what others find missing in philosophy, it being referred to as an abstract discipline. So mine is rather um, focused on the practical application of philosophy. And so, as, as a vehicle or as an inspiration, um, I was able to come up with the idea of merging political science and philosophy and apply it to my more than a decade interest, which is feminism. So basic concepts or important concepts in my presentation include the philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, her work titled The Second Sex, her philosophy called existentialist feminism, and the so-called Philippine Magna Carta of Women. Anyone who's familiar with the Magna Carta of Women? Yes, yes there are students who are familiar. So, my study, which is a product of the of patience, effort, and perseverance of um, also of my advisor, Dr. Lovino, Lovino Garcia, is uh, titled Simone de Beauvoir's Existentialist Feminism, a Critical Reading of the Philippine Magna Carta of Women. My aim um, in doing this study was to clarify notions on concepts on, on concepts of the Filipina or the Filipino woman, concepts, philosophical concepts or existential concepts, transcendence, feminist concept on empowerment and, and freedom and equality as well as to provide a possible groundwork for laws on women, hopefully not just in the Philippines, but also in other countries. Furthermore, I also aim to have a deeper understanding of the Philippine Magna Carta of women in the context of Beauvoir's philosophy through what I later on discovered to be the themes of existentialist feminism, which I call situated freedom and reciprocal recognition. So the, fo the focus of my study uh, were on the following um, points. To identify the themes of Simone de Beauvoir's existentialist feminism based on her manum opus to the second sex. To um, identify the substantive provisions of the Philippine Magna Carta of Women. And finally to have uh, to, to use the existentialist feminist themes identified in reading the substantive provisions of the Magna Carta of Women. So in doing this, I was able to um, come up with three chapters of my dissertation. And in the first part of my study, I was um, able to explore on the themes of uh, Simone de Beauvoir's existentialist feminism by reading the second sex. Um, also referring to her existentialism on the works, uh, on her uh, earlier works titled Pyrrhus et Cineas and the Ethics of Ambiguity. 
So here, um, there was um, inevitably an exploration on her biography as essential in situating why her philosophy, why 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 she has um, she um, established or her philosophy that way. So it's rather a constructive summary of the chapters of the uh, second sex as well. Uh, so included in the, the first part of the study is the summary and the biography of Simone de Beauvoir. The, the, the second sex is the biography of Beauvoir. On the second part, there's um, a discussion on uh, the Philippine Magna Carta of Women, this being considered as the Bill of Rights of the Filipina. So if you know what contains, what, what contains our constitutional Bill of Rights, you know that uh, the Bill of Rights of the woman uh, contains the rights and benefits or privileges the woman is entitled. So, uh, in this part of the study as well, the salient points of the law are identified. I also looked into, um, just very quickly, the history of the law and its evolution, how its name has been uh, finalized that way and then identify or distinguish the so-called procedural provisions versus the substantive provisions. Aside from the presentation of the salient points, an account of the history of the law and its evolution to concretely situate the law, the law were also included. The third part of the study is a presentation of the what I call the Beauvoirian reading of the identified provisions of the Magna Carta. So here, um, with, the, with all 47 sections of the Magna Carta, I was able to identify 30 of them as substantive provisions and use them in, in, in the reading of, of the Magna Carta using the themes of Simon de Beauvoir. So this is how the presentation will go. But I'd like to begin um, with Simon de Beauvoir's existentialist feminism. Or, uh, or maybe her feminism, as some of you probably know, she's she what she became popular during the second wave feminism. And what else do we know about her? She she's known she's more popular, being known as the partner of sino philosopher of Jean Paul Sartre. In fact, in some readings or in some works, they say we do not know who who's. We do not know who influenced whom. So there, there's been debate on um, whose original works have been the works of both Beauvoir and Sartre because they they highly influenced each other. Basta alam natin um, when when they both died, parehong they're in the same grave. No, magkatabi sila sa isa't isa sa Montparnasse. So Simone de Beauvoir is popular about uh, it, uh, popularized the book the book the second sex okay and here she expounded her idea or her her opposition on uh, of of the society and of men um, against women particularly on the oppression women experience because of um, of generally men so he, she came with um, the famous statement, one is not born but rather becomes woman or a woman as representation of her feminism. And since uh, Beauvoir has been highly exposed to existentialist writings manifest in her many works, um, her, her feminism is later on identified as existentialist. So her existentialism is scattered through her many works, and there are recurring uh, th um, in her works there are recurring concepts on existentialism, namely freedom, responsibility, and uh, they give voice to core themes of existentialist philosophy. So here are some works where we can find her existentialist ethics or philosophy um, focus and then the second sex is more focused on existentialism as applied to the situation of the woman. Hence, the concept existentialist feminism as associated with Simone de Beauvoir. 
So some would say that this could be identified or categorized as one strand of feminism. If you're familiar with the many strands of feminism, uh, this is an addition to these strands of feminism or types of feminism. So the theme, based on my uh, reading and analysis of the second sex, these are the themes of existentialist feminism. Uh, before I go there, aside from Simone de Beauvoir, um, uh, there, there are also increasing literature uh, saying that Mary Daly, an American feminist philosopher, is also um, developing her own existentialist feminism. But of course, before this philosopher came um, Simone de Beauvoir Mina. So this is a uh, very brief, um, the, the outline of The Second Sex. So it's a rather thick book, but not as thick as the other works of the philosophers. But basically, this, the, the books contain what uh, Beauvoir would talk about in her existentialist feminism. Um, the Second Sex primary thesis is that men fundamentally oppress women by characterizing them on every level as other. So this is, this, is, this is not new in philosophy, and this is not new among those who are uh, uh, keeping abreast on the issue of women in the Philippines and in the world. We've, we've, we've known of um, inequality between men and women since time immemorial. And in fact, in 1949, when Beauvoir was writing about the second sex, when she started to write about the second sex, she said that this topic, the, the topic of the issue of women, is not something new, or the oppression of the issue of women is not something new to write about. In fact, there have been a lot of authors who wrote about them. Sabi niya nga, masyado ng voluminous ang writings about them. Uh, however, she, her stand was that um, none of them was able to address the real issue of the, the situation of the woman. So her, her contribution is, her work is her contribution to, to, in trying to address the issue of the oppression of the women. So we have um, concepts such as the woman is inessential, and then the man is the essential, the woman is the incomplete, the man is the absolute, the woman is the mutilated male, and the man is the transcendent. So based on this, um, on this uh, background, she was able to um, come up with the second sex. And from, from, from her book, I was able to identify uh, the elements of her, of her existentialist feminism. Being, so common siya sa existentialist works, um, it's a common, these are common terms and these are situations, so it refers to how a woman, a human being as an individual consciousness is engaged in the world. Example, uh, my situation is not something outside or around me, but the glue which binds my freedom and my facticity together. That's the first element of EF or existentialist feminism. Second is facticity. So facticity refers to the necessary connection between consciousness and the world. Example, the facts of my birth. So biological realities, okay? My body, the existence of other people, my death. Third element is immanence, which refers to, the, to a being that is incapable of realizing itself. We, uh, this can be referred in other uh, philosophers' contexts as the being in itself that which has no life, that which has no existence. So immanence leads to the degradation of existence. Finally, the fourth element of EF is transcendence. So uh, on the more positive side, uh, there's an existential concept called transcendence, which is described as the ability of the individual to freely pursue a project. So from these four, uh, from these four themes, um, for Beauvoir, she says that the key to understanding women's oppression, her, her response to the problem of the woman, of the situation of the woman, is that women have been relegated to a sphere of activity that departs them from being transcendent, that cuts them off from their transcendence. So here she tries to resolve it by 
proposing for solutions, and she mentions in the last part of her book, um, economic independence, which to some is one solution, but to some critics of Beauvoir's work, it's not a sufficient solution to achieve transcendence. So my contribution here is um, the, the formulation of what I call the themes of existentialist feminism, merging or, uh, or uh, playing around the four, uh, four elements of existentialism, transcendence, situation, facticity, and immanence. So simply put, um, the themes of existentialist feminism that I have identified are the following. Situated freedom. And this is the woman's capacity to create her own project, not according to the dictate of whatever social institutions or social construction, but her capacity to make meaning according to how she wants that project to be. This is the same uh, idea with what I conceived in college as um, what I term to be a solution to oppression of women, which is social reconstructionism. Although rather ambitious, this idea is basically talking about changing the perspective or paradigm on how we see women as inferior, inessential, or mutilated uh, members of the society. So situated freedom is an existential concept of woman's use of freedom in consideration of her situation as female, who has a biological facticity, we have no choice, this is our body, but for which she must pursue a project to shape her identity and create a position from which to interpret the world. So from that biological facticity, the situated freedom concept is saying that the woman can still make meaning out of it and can still create a project that would lead towards transcendence and not be bound by biological, biological um, uh, limitations. So the pursuit of the chosen project must be constant and dynamic, something that is not uh, random or sporadic and one-time, big-time throwing of project. Rather, it should be something constant and dynamic and should be continuously pursued and renewed until such time that uh, the level of transcendence is achieved. So that is the first theme of existentialist feminism. The second one is what I call um, reciprocal recognition. So reciprocal recognition here means the necessary engagement of the other sex in the pursuit of the fulfillment of woman's chosen project. So here, it's simply um, opening, it's simply requiring the idea of inclusion of the male in the pursuance, in the pursuit of the uh, the woman's project, okay, towards achieving transcendence. Because for Beauvoir, freedom of the self requires the freedom of others. So it's not just act, uh, the woman acting alone without the concern of others. Otherwise, she calls them to be void of freedom. So reciprocal recognition is the same thing with our idea of inclusivity or inclusion of anyone and everyone who could take special role in the fulfillment of the woman's project. In summary, uh, themes of existentialist feminism are situated freedom and then reciprocal recognition. Okay. The Philippine Magna Carta of women, on the other hand, as what I said, the so-called uh, Bill of Rights of the Filipina serves as the country's gender equality law. So, pwedeng overuse term na yung gender equality, equality, um, um, the, 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 the difference between sex and gender. You are woke individuals, so you probably know what, how to distinguish them. But let me share the Magna Carta of women as essential in achieving transcendence, essential in essential uh, to be applied reciprocal recognition and um, situated freedom. Note, uh, as, a, as, a, as a starter on this part of the presentation, that the Magna Carta is not called Magna Carta for women, as it is different from the Magna Carta of women, which is the specific title of the, the law. So RA 9710, and it's not for, because for indicates that someone outside of the woman gave the Magna Carta to her. 
versus Magna Carta of women, which means that it, it expresses ownership of the law by women. They themselves did the law, and then they themselves, the, it, the law emanated from them. So uh, it's very significant that we call the Magna Carta of women as, uh, as such because it's, it's a manifestation of women's um, choosing of the project or the situated freedom. Okay, so the, the 47 provisions of the Magna Carta have been categorized into two. The procedural part yung deals on the manner how the rights or obligations should be enforced, so such as, sino dapat ang magpatupad ng batas, or the duty bearer of the law. That's one example of the substantive uh, the procedural provision. And the other clause, in the, usually of the latter part of the law, those are called procedural uh, provisions. But the focus of the paper is on the substantive provisions. And these are the parts of the law which create, which create, define, and regulate rights. Such as according women benefits or opportunities to also be, uh, be occupy um, third level positions in the government, which is one of the requirements of the law. So it's a rather short law. Um, if you if you're interested to read about uh, to read about it, uh, nyo yung IRR so because that is what is being implemented, and um, these are some of the substantive provisions. I'll just uh, run through the slides and um, show you all 30 pro substantive provisions which I used in order to um, um, read the law using the existentialist feminist themes. So special leave benefits for women, food security and productive um, resources, right to housing, um, representation, participation, yeah, etc. Now, based on the provisions of the law, there are three general categories of the provisions, namely empowerment, equality, and equity. We understand how one is different from the other, I suppose. But this is an image of how uh, of distinguishing equality from equity. As you notice in the on the on the left side, um, that side is a representation of equality. And by equality in in Beauvoir's philosophy, she doesn't mean equality in the same same. That's the same. It's, it's also the, the idea that's also uh, supported by, by the Philippine Magna Carta of Women. Um, but it's equality wherein, not sameness, but rather yung idea nga na pagkakapantay-pantay, what you accord as rights to male uh, or the men should also be accorded to the women. Equity, on the other hand, is this. So this is what we're trying to address as far as the Magna Carta is concerned. Yung bang, if you imagine that the male and the female, the default of the male and the female used to be this, and because of the oppression, discrimination, and violence against women, the drag yung baba, e pa baba. Okay? So the, def the default situation has been uh, made, made this equilibrium. And so what we're trying to do through our laws is to catch up with uh, many deprivations experienced by the woman in such a way that we go back to the default or to the equilibrium. So that is equity. So if the, the, young, the, the little boy in purple needs more, more patungan in order to see the, the view, then you should accord that to him, and that is equity. <clears throat> So in reading the substantive provisions of the Magna Carta through the lens of the second sex, it can be seen, or yeah, it has been identified that situated freedom is manifested by provisions on women empowerment, okay, while reciprocal recognition is exhibited by provisions on equity and equality. So this is a definition of empowerment as far as the Magna Carta is concerned. It is a provision, it's defined as provision, availability, and accessibility of opportunities, services, and observance of human rights. Such as equal access to ownership, to management, and control of production, 
and of material and informational resources and benefits in the family, community, and society. Specifically, there's the so-called substantive, substantive provision in the law, and this is the full and equal enjoyment of rights and freedom contemplated under the Magna Carta. There's also a mention of gender equality, which we, we're probably more pro familiar with. It pertains to the principle asserting the equality of men and women and their right to enjoy equal conditions, realizing their full human potentials, full and satisfying life. That's the goal of gender equality. It means to arrive at fairness between the sexes as relevant to the context of recipro reciprocal recognition. So, um, considering these, it is generally deduced that the othering of woman or the, the um, disadvantaged position of the woman in Beauvoir, the second sex, could be identified uh, on three levels of othering. So, namely, neglect. Okay? Neglect means the non-inclusion of women in the implementation of certain rights, privileges, and opportunities such as uh, her being deprived of the right to vote or the right to education. So that's uh, those are some examples of neglect. Deprivation of woman is the second level of othering, uh, which means non-inclusion non similar with neglect, but that whose resolution requires reciprocity. It's and then third one is oppression. So the level the levels of othering have been identified according to their to their gravity. So neglect is are, is lighter compared to deprivation and oppression. And oppression refers to abuse of woman by society due to her facticity. So we have being catcalled because you're babae or uh, wolf whistling because you're babae or being raped because of your being woman. This form of othering may be resolved only by means of temporarily providing preferential treatment. So this is what I was talking about na nagkaroon ng imbalance. So what we, what the woman needs is to catch up, to uh, to lessen or to, to have a narrow, narrower gap between the man and the woman. And this is resolved through, according to the Magna Carta, equity. So in the further analysis of the Magna Carta and Beauvoir's existentialist feminism, Situated freedom is seen as the solution to neglect, and uh, as a result of that, women are empowered. Reciprocal recognition as a theme of existentialist feminism could address oppression, um, uh, a, ve a vehicle of which um, is, or as a result of that, equity. Now, 10 years since the Magna Carta of Women has been uh, promulgated or has been passed into law. 2009 siya na, na ipasa. No? Um, the law kasi specifically indicates that uh, by, so, by this year, women should have um, a 50% level of parang um, women in the government should 50% of the women in the government should be in the third level position. O kaya naman, uh, institutions who are bound to follow the law are not supposed to expel or not admit students who get pregnant out of wedlock. So these are the impacts of the law. And th there's a so-called women's priority legislative agenda based on what has, uh, from the time the law has been implemented, so there has been, there, there have been movements or advocacies towards uh, resolving problems of oppression and uh, violence against women. So, isa kasi sa mga uh, nire-require ng batas is, is that all other existing laws or, or statutes that are not, that, that are deemed uh, um, to be discriminatory to women have to be either repealed or amended. So, here, you can see that this is from the uh, PCW kasi recently, um, the, the, the RA 9710 uh, has been celebrated because naka 10 years na nga siya. So there's been uh, movements or improvements as far as some laws are concerned, specifically number two, so maternity leave, diba, from originally, ilang days nga ba, six, 
68, na increase siya to 105. And it's even extend, it can be extended to 30 years na unpaid. On the other hand, para hindi naman unfair sa lalaki, meron pwede rin bang mag-paternity leave? Um, entitled ang lalaki to so number of days na paternity leave and he can actually borrow five days of the maternity leave of the wife to, to be used as paternity leave. And then number five is strengthening law enforcement and protection against sexual offenses. So uh, improving or expanding the anti-sexual harassment law. But however, the rest uh, pending pa or no significant actions um, yet. So if we talk about the rights of the woman, um, actually, madami siyang, madami siyang karapatan at madami siyang batas, no? Kaya nga, probably some may would say, ang dami namang karapatan ng babae. Um, one of the latest is the Safe Spaces Act. If you're familiar with the Bawal Bastos Act, it was, um, it was uh, promulgated, or yeah, ay, uh, um, nung July, eh, I think it's April or July, so Bawal Bastos. And it was the president who signed the bill, or who made the bill effective. So these are significant changes, and we are thankful to our government and to some other um, individuals who have been advocating for moving forward to improve the situation of the woman. Um, and I'm sharing this as my little contribution to hopefully um, educating some of you to hopefully be enlightened uh, on how um, the, on the situation of the woman. So I go back to my aim. My aim was to clarify notions on concepts of Filipino woman, transcendence, empowerment, freedom, and equality, and to provide a possible groundwork for laws on women in other countries. By using the existentialist feminist themes of Beauvoir, situated freedom and reciprocal recognition in reading the Magna Carta, the law can be appreciated in its truest sense in elevating the regard of the society about women's role in nation building being part of the constitution now provision. The, theme, the themes accentuate the Filipino woman's need to transcend as an independent Filipina. In any given scenario, change can only be achieved through one's exercise of her situated freedom and the acknowledgement of the other that his or her role in the so-called reciprocal recognition if necessary. So since um, the time I, I was able to successfully defend my thesis, I was able to share um, to various audiences um, the lesson I got from this study and I hope I also was able to share something to you, something you can take home um, as, as you continue to live in this existence. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, can you hear me at the back? Okay, good afternoon. I'm Jenny or to Austin. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Dr. Opiniano for an excellent lecture and a groundbreaking study. And I would like to thank Dr. Paking also for inviting me to be part of this very interesting event. All right, in her study, Dr. Opiniano provides us with a thoughtful look at a significant piece of legislation through the lens of Simone de Beauvoir's existentialist feminism philosophy. As such, it is a worthy work that interrogates the intentions and thought processes that shape the crafting of a law meant to have a meaningful impact on the lives of Filipino women, particularly those who do not have the resources to address their life issues independently of state assistance. In her works, The Second Sex, and to a certain extent, in her Ethics of Ambiguity, Beauvoir relates the existence of the individual to their responsi uh, responsibility to, quote, provide meaning to his or her existence, unquote. She points out that across history, enfranchisement has been withheld from women by male domination of the social sphere, preventing or at the least hindering women from pursuing the search for such meaningful connections. Linked inextricably as women were to their relegation quote to domestic work, this limiting the capacity of the women to surpass such predetermined role, unquote. As Dr. Opiniano said, a key point of Beauvoir's philosophy is that women are defined as the other in opposition to men who are the one Man is the self, the subject, while women are the object, the other. He is essential, 
transcendent. He acts and creates. Women are imminent. She waits for him to save her and give her life direction, purpose, and meaning. Both women have been relegated to sphere of activity that cuts them off from their transcendence, Dr. Pinyana said. Entering the modern era, the status of women change. They are now, Dr. Pinyana writes, quote, enfranchised members of society, unquote. However, quote, their being second-class citizens remains an issue, unquote. In the Philippines, this concept of women as a type of subordinate creature existing on a level below that or separate from men is manifested in oppressions that stem from culture and religion. Dr. Opiniano says, quote, the antiquated provisions in the family and Muslim codes violate women's rights to equality, dignity, and prosperity, choice of res residence and profession, and access to justice. Access to justice. Enter now the law called the Philippine Magna Carta of Women, the Republic Act 9710, promulgated in 2009, that she says, quote, seeks to eliminate discrimination through the recognition, protection, fulfillment, and promotion of the rights of Filipino women, unquote. Therefore, Dr. Opiniano argues, a reading of the law through the lens of Bouvard's Philosophy is justified inasmuch as the law, quote, recognizes the tragedy of human existence, unquote, and recognizes, quote, a need for connection with others and engagement in the world, unquote. Among its other objectives, the law seeks to reduce the othering of women that takes place in our patriarchal society by providing three main benefits, empowerment, equality, and gender equity, and security or protection. Dr. Opiniano points out that the existentialist concept of transcendence is embedded in the Magna Carta in that certain provisions of the law translate to the, quote, active involvement of the subject in a project which denotes going beyond the prescribed essence, unquote. In other words, transcendence. In this, the feminist aim of achieving equal status with men is in part met. Bovo also believes that as the second sex, women have been deprived of the recognition of their rights. The Magna Carta, Dr. Opiniano points out, seeks to redress this injustice and balance the privileges of men and women in society by providing for reciprocity, another concept Bovar espouses by adopting gender mainstreaming and other strategies to promote gender equality and eliminate gender discrimination in the workplace, the military, the civil service, sports, and other areas of human endeavor. Dr. Pignano makes a good case for the connection between Beauvoir's philosophy and the Magna Carta of women. Point by point, she has shown such linkages exist, and the overall theme of the law in this regard relates to women's freedom, as she terms it, situated freedom, the freedom to explore opportunities to be, quote, economically recognized, unquote, which she says is proof of the, quote, presence of existentialist feminism, unquote. Freedom to choose activities that give their life, quote, greater meaning, unquote, and eschew traditional roles related to the division of labor, quote, which assigns her entirely to the general and unessential that which does not give any greater meaning." Unquote. Dr. Opiniano's exercise in intellectual interpretation also prompts us to ask questions. What other laws may be interpreted in terms of their content through the lens of philosophies? How beneficial might it be if the creation of laws were approached from this direction? wherein the concepts and ideas of a particular philosophy are used to craft laws in accordance with them. Ateneo's father, Roque Ferriol, said at the plenary lecture in Germany in 2005, quote, taking philosophy as it is commonly understood in academic circles, the Philippines does not have a tradition of philosophy. However, as with all human beings, there is an experience of self within the horizon of reality, and the urge to understand and shape the experience. 
This can be called the drive toward wisdom. Unquote. Be that as it may, that Filipinos have no formal philosophy, philosophies that have been neatly structured, fleshed out, and written down, we as a people possess indigenous knowledge, belief, and behavioral systems, and other cultural traditions and artifacts that equate to a body of wisdom contextualized in time and place. And we as scholars can choose to use these bodies of Philippine-centric pools of wisdom and knowledge to move toward a decolonized approach in interpreting societal institutions and phenomena. This is not to advocate the rejection of Western philosophy altogether. Living as we do in this time and age, we have the privilege of using both approaches to our advantage. In this regard, Father Ferriol says, quote, the colonized can choose between complete surrender and complete rejection. Or, the colonized can develop the art of seeing the colonizers as just one more outside influence to be shunned insofar as it blocks insight, to be used insofar as it helps insight, unquote. Might we further adapt Beauvoir's existentialist feminism into our particular Philippine context and see where exploring that will take us? As a communication scholar, I asked, how is this concept of othering communicated? How else may we define or interpret the concept of women as other in Philippine society? Women are not only othered in opposition to men, they are also othered in opposition to men and other women in terms of status on the basis of social demographics. Therefore, the Magna Carta of Women contains specific provisions for the marginalized and vulnerable women in society. The problem of othering women in Philippine society deserves a closer look and interrogation into its origin, nature, manifestations, and most importantly, the ways it can be addressed, solved, or eliminated, apart from such measures as the Magna Carta of Women. Dr. Opiniano has, in this respect, taken us on the first step of this journey and blazes a trail for the rest of us. Her work challenges us to discover in yet how many other aspects of society, philosophy may be recognized to have informed, shaped, molded, directed, and been of service. Thank you. Please approach the, micro, uh, the microphones on either side of the panel. Are there any questions or comments on the uh, speaker's presentation? Please come forward. I'm uh, Kiara. Um, I'm a fourth year uh, student of philosophy. So um, uh, please forgive me if I may have a misguided uh, comment or question regarding your talk. I may have missed the first part. But uh, uh, my friend and I were talking about uh, your whole presentation and I was kind of thinking uh, we, we can only clamor for so much uh, rights, laws, and privileges for women but um, as long as the mentality remains the same as long as we're e so, uh, this is an affirmation with what uh, ma'am said earlier that this could be a cultural thing no? na kahit mag-ask tayo ng equality for women and men pero if yung perception natin ng babae at lalaki remains the same in a predominantly patriarchal society. No? Ano po sa tingin niyo opinion nyo? Don't you think that a re-education, a reorientation to human value, human dignity, sabi ng friend ko, value formation can be a starting point instead of forcing or encouraging this Western or European idea of feminism. Mahirap in, in a culture such as ours, medyo mahirap kasi siyang baliin eh, yung... Na, Nanagigyan siya po ba? 
Thank you, nice comment. And this is something um, very common among the audience who would listen to my talk. And I would still, I, I would say the same thing to those previous, um, uh, the same comments I have previously encountered. Um, two things, Yan. I would go back to the idea of, I agree, it's something ambitious, it's something systemic, it's something cultural thing which which could be difficult to battle with. In fact, sometimes, in fact, I, I would think that it would it would take um, centuries or if not more than that to battle with such kind of, of a systemic mindset. So I, I proposed when I was in college the idea of social reconstructionism, which I said during my talk is rather ambitious because social reconstructionism is a change of paradigm or a change of the mindset. But on the second aspect, I think that um, it could be resolved through, I agree, education. Education is something already integrated in the laws. It's, al it's already actually mandated. It's, it's mandated by the Magna Carta that institutions, both private and public, should do gender mainstreaming. So in doing gender mainstreaming or integrating gender education in the curricula, in the programs and projects of the institution, we, are, uh, uh, we look forward to correcting or rectifying the mindset of the man and the wo woman in the society, uh, of the old age uh, stereotype, preconceived notions, and other um, rather culturally dragging or identity dragging uh, ideas that we socially construct against the men and the women. So education remains to be a key, but it also goes with, of course, the idea of being open about changing our mindset or changing a paradigm to have a full, um, full uh, embrace of the essence of the laws that are increasing in our society. No, I'm sorry. Um, a quick follow up, lang po. Mm -hmm. Kasi I feel that we can only philosophize so much about this. Mm -hmm. Pero we know na um, usually yung mga forms of oppression na nabanggit nyo kanina happens in, an, in the uneducated class. Mm -hmm. So how do we extend yung nalalaman natin ngayon outside with other people who don't have access to education? To do, um, okay. The, that's the reason why the Magna Carta requires the presence of, of um, the anti vausi desk in the barangay level and the presence of the NGOs that advocate for the rights of women or educate the people about these laws uh, to, to extend to the population that do not reach avenues or opportunities like this. But in her, ako lang, practically speaking, in our own little ways, ikaw bilang isang estudyante na maaaring exposed sa social media, could do your own little thing in trying to educate your followers or your friends and do other activities such as uh, through your organizations or through the council to, to reach out to the people who are unfortunate to be enlightened uh, as, as we are fortunate to be having opportunities like this. Thank you. Thank you. Have room for one more question? Hello, Salam. Hi, I'm Jian. Uh, Rainer Reyes from the Department of Philosophy. Um, I'm not going to miss the part of the video because I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to discuss it. Um, that was advocate. Naman. Now, the distinction or the opposition between man and woman is very vague, specifically, especially now that there are many other voices in between. So the question is, do you think that the heart of women is still relevant today? Second question, if there are already other voices like LGBTQIA+, do you think we can also imagine society that can have a Magna Carta of LGBTQIA+. And if it's possible, what are you think? You know, what are the possible dangers? Dangers, Okay. Thank you, sir. Rainier. Is the law still relevant until this time? It's the law is only ten year old, 
uh, usually laws are repealed for so number of years. But I think as, uh, as a decade-old law, is it, it is yet to reach its, its full potential. In fact, I, I think I, uh, I shared na, uh, there's a provision in the law that requires that uh, for this uh, year, women should be of at par level, uh, at par on, in terms of quantity or population on, th on third level position, positions in the government. And um, as reflected in the update of the Philippine Commission of Women, um, it's still moving towards completion or actualization of its um, legislative projects. So it, to me, it's still relevant, even with the advent of, of uh, the other realities on the existence of the LGBT or the, the different sexual orientations which I think is also possible to, uh, to, to give birth to a so-called Magna Carta of the LGBT. Now, implications of that would, would uh, expand as far as issues of morality, if not uh, openness of the culture to, 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 uh, to some versions of morality. But um, just like the issue of women being the second sex, which has been which has been the issue for quite a time in many generations or in many cultures like the Philippines, um, I think the magna the the potential uh, birth of the Magna Carta of the LGBT will also give rise to the same acceptance of the culture of the society um, for the LGBT. I, I, that's, that's my, uh, th those are my first thoughts about it. I could think about uh, and, uh, infinite implications, but I'd like to believe that it could also be accepted this, as warm as the acceptance of the society for the women. Thank you very much.